Clancy Pasta presents A Producer Filmed a Horror Movie in Our House Written by Ronnie Fordham and narrated by Clancy I moved my two kids into a haunted house and I didn't even know it. No one had told us about Bishop Manor's dark history. None of the stories about hearing weird noises, feeling cold spots, or seeing hacked up ghosts watching you. My realtor chalked it all up to a technicality, the emotional defect rule. As long as I never asked about the house's past, he never had to tell us a damn thing about it. And of course, now it was too late. I'd already bought the house with all the money I had left after my husband Jesse's murder. Jesse was killed only a few months ago. While he was out of town for work and away from us, he was all alone in an Atlanta motel room when he was stabbed to death. His face had been mangled beyond belief, the facial skin almost ripped off like a cheap mask. Nothing was stolen and there wasn't a motive just a random slaughter. I was left in tears and shambles, and so were the kids. The Christensen family had to persevere. I couldn't let us down. Jesse was always a strong leader. Tall and muscular and handsome, his smooth brown skin was a perfect canvas for those striking eyes and a radiant smile. I still can picture his dimples and laugh when I lay down at night. He was the optimist between us, and my Jesse deserved better than what happened to him. I decided to move the kids to Bisham Manor. The mansion was located in LaGrange, Georgia, Jesse's hometown, and in what was his dream house. We were about 40 miles from Columbus, where him and I have been living the American dream. Jesse and his general manager job at St. Francis Hospital, and me as a licensed therapist. The kids welcomed the move, but after Jesse's death, I couldn't trust anyone. I never left Bisham, and I didn't let Jason or Kate leave, either. Over the past few months, I'd lost my spirit. Like a disease, Jesse's murder hit me hard. I quit the job and stayed at home all the time. Not because I wanted to, but because I had to. I surrendered my hobbies to the sadness. No more did I watch football or Netflix. I couldn't even find solace in reading. Megan Christensen had gone from a warm wife to a stoic single mother. My looks had also deteriorated during the depression. I was still pretty, but I used to be real hot. I had a smile that matched Jesse's, not to mention long, flowing brown hair, hazel eyes, and I made sure to keep clean. I was obsessive about showering, skin care, and keeping my hair as pristine as possible. I was cynical, but at least I was charming. My dry sense of humor never meant to insult or belittle anyone. But all of that changed when Jesse passed. The truth is, my looks used to be able to disguise my stress or middle age, but nothing could hide grief. I gained weight. My hair became sculpted in a constant disarray of knots and frizz. Of course, I showered less. My fingernails gave way to talons. My fine looks had deteriorated from that of a regal portrait to a gothic painting. But through it all, my kids kept me going. Together, we hid out in Bisham Manor. I homeschooled them. I cooked supper every night. Our only trips away from this fortress were for groceries, but we still got by. Jason was ten, and Kate was nine, both of them cute and clever. Even after Jesse died, their youthful glow didn't fade. Jason took more after me. He was quiet and reserved, neither fat nor skinny, a nice smile to go along with his intricate introspection. Kate was more like Jesse, bright, sharp, and oh-so-inquisitive, not to mention tall. Her face was full of beaming beauty, her optimism absolutely amazing. I cared for them the best I could, like an overprotective mom on steroids. And honestly, 
The kids took care of me. Their love and joy kept me from giving up all hope. They were the beacon of light in this dark, dark house. Regardless of all the rumors, we felt no evil here at Bisham. The three-story LaGrange mansion sat on a large four-acre lot. The brick mansion, close to a hundred years old. The lighting wasn't the best and the furniture resembled antique store rejects, but we had so much room. The manor was a palace all three of us could share. I let the kids decorate their bedrooms how they wanted. I even had a home office where I could just write or do work from home jobs. The office was actually bigger than my room. In there, I had shelves of paperbacks awaiting my touch for whenever I was ready to dive back into brainless entertainment. Not to mention a huge circular window looking out at the rural highway and miles of farmland surrounding us. The house's yellow walls basked us with welcoming warmth, the brick fireplace optimal for those cozy winter nights. Plus, the TV and internet wasn't a problem even though we lived 10 miles outside town. A security gate wrapped around our entire property, so we always felt safe, even inside a supposedly haunted house. But deep down, I wondered if maybe I should have asked our realtor and the locals for more information on why Bisham had the reputation it did. I just didn't want the fear planted in my mind. The less I knew, the better. Besides, the house was cold enough as is without adding constant chills to the equation. And I damn sure didn't want Jason or Kate to hear any of these legends. But in February, a group ambushed our utopia. In a cavalry of vans and sports cars, I saw a group of filmmakers stop right outside our front gate. A producer named Phyllis Burton gave me a call. Her haggard voice broke down everything with clear precision. Apparently, the house's previous owners had given this Netflix crew permission to film a movie in our house. Rumors of Bisham being haunted proved too powerful to pull for Phyllis's team. Naturally, I was hesitant. Amidst the cries of my excited children, I relented to the team on one condition. Don't tell my kids about the house's terrifying lore. They didn't need to become jaded or frightened. Not this young, at least. To be honest, I also couldn't resist the pay. $500 a day in what would be a quick one-week shoot. Phyllis promised they'd shoot around us as well, and most of the cast and crew had their own trailers outside. So when all was said and done, I signed the agreement. We opened our Bisham doors to these B-list filmmakers. I guess the cast and crew were friendly enough. Not overwhelming like you'd expect from a Hollywood production. But as Phyllis put it, this was an ultra-low budget shoot. Going off her own indifferent description, the script was a generic haunted house movie. No one really famous was in the cast. And the story was so threadbare she even said they'd find a way to work around all the changes we'd made to Bisham. Hell, the movie didn't even have a title. Like a domineering CEO, Phyllis oversaw the entire production. She even had more power than the director Dan Crawford. Phyllis always wore suits. She was a pretty, yet overstressed 40-year-old. Short brown hair without a touch of gray, yet I could tell those sleepless nights were starting to wear on what was once a flawless face. She was much stronger than Dan, not to mention much louder, her voice full of brute force and ferocity. But I could tell her bossiness came from passion rather than ego. Dan wasn't a slouch either. He was a true professional, the polar opposite of what I expected going off his overweight frame, penchant for wearing tight shirts and sunglasses, and his long greasy hair. Then again, he responded to Phyllis like a dutiful schoolboy. Not that I could blame him. Everything went well those first few days. The crew stayed out of our way, and we stayed out of theirs. I felt like we were living a reality show without having to endure the attention being on us. Me, Jason, and Kate could just live our lives behind the scenes, usually in my bedroom. Cartoons and cereal are main entertainment, along with a shitload of coffee for me. I also didn't mind the extra lights and furniture the production brought. 
the temporary redecorating made up for the lead actress's awful screaming. And with all these people here, the house felt warmer, less lonely. The kids and I had spent so much time alone, I had forgotten how nice it was to have company. The crew and us would eat dinner together, drink coffee in the mornings. We bonded. Our big group felt like a tight army. One late night, I talked to Phyllis by the Keurig, just her and I as we usually stayed up later than everyone else. How are y'all so fast? I asked. Like, y'all move quick. Do we? Phyllis joked. Yeah, y'all just seem really efficient. Phyllis nodded. Yeah, well, she flashed a knowing smile. It's not our first time here, actually. Stunned, I looked right at her mischievous grin. What? Really? Yeah, we shot a movie here last year, Phyllis went on. It's the perfect spot for haunted house flicks, you know. I chuckled. Don't put it like that. Phyllis caressed my shoulder, her pale, skeletal hand surprisingly soothing. No, I really want to thank you for this, Megan. I mean it. We really enjoy shooting here. Oh, uh, it's no problem. Like a proud architect, Phyllis turned and motioned around the kitchen. The yellow walls, the chandelier that looked stolen off the Titanic, not to mention the refrigerator covered in magnet picture frames showing me, Jesse, and the kids. So you guys really haven't experienced anything weird here? Phyllis asked. I watched her keep admiring the house. Not really, I replied. I just try to stay away from that kind of stuff. A sip of coffee helped calm my building unease. Phyllis faced me. But the history, Megan. You can't ignore it. Full of excited passion, she stopped right in front of me. There's just too much here. I felt it. I gave her a confused look. What do you mean? Have y'all seen ghosts? Grinning, Phyllis nodded. Yeah. Why else do you think we keep coming back? I forced a scoff. Come on. In storyteller mode, Phyllis took a casual sip. No, I swear. I felt cold spots. I know Dan says he's seen a guy walking around, bleeding everywhere. That's weird. Yeah, Phyllis said. Crew members tell me things. Like, they hear voices. Someone told me he's seen blood on the walls. That's crazy, I interrupted. Realizing how scared I'd become, Phyllis just kept giving me that playful smile. I know. It's just a shame we never get any of it on tape. I forced a confident laugh. Well, I ain't seen anything. My next sip finished off the coffee. I promise. Only Phyllis and her gang did get evidence. The next night, they were filming in the kitchen. A scary ghost scene that got all the more creepier when the refrigerator magnets began getting ripped off by an unseen force. One by one, they flew off in a methodical pattern. Together, the magnets scattered all across the floor in a long trail. Some of them were tourist trinkets. Some of them showed photos of the movie's fictional family. But included amongst them were the pictures of my family. Pictures of Jesse and I with the kids. An excited Dan and Phyllis showed me the footage in my office. All of us sat on my computer like we were in a movie theater. I felt nothing but sheer horror. I refused to let Jason or Kate see it. And honestly, I wished I hadn't seen it myself. Sure, maybe Phyllis was just using movie-making wizardry, but this shit looked authentic. The magnets were pulled off with real force, and the photos of my family were the very last ones to come hurtling down. 
That's crazy, I told them. That's really weird. Yeah, we're gonna use it in the final cut, Dan exclaimed. Phyllis flashed him a cold glare. Shut it, Dad. He threw his hands up. What? Disturbed, I sat at the computer. My eyes fixated on that picture of me and Jesse with the kids. A few of the actors said they felt the room get colder, Phyllis told me. Tears welling up, I didn't listen to much else of what she had to say. I didn't want to. Not when Jesse's eyes and big smile on the photo were staring back at me. The memory is so much more haunting than whatever paranormal activity Dan Crawford had just captured. That night was rough. All the magnets flying off proved we had something here at Bisham. I just didn't know who or what it was. While the crew stayed up late filming in the living room, I had Jason and Kate sleep in my room with me. Emotional support after watching the video. The bed was big enough for the three of us, the bathroom only a few steps away. I kept the lamps and TV on. From the shelves, all of our framed photos were watching over us like angels. Late night Scooby-Doo proved to be an easy distraction, an easy lullaby to put the kids to sleep. But I was stuck in between them like two uncomfortable pillows. I kept tossing and turning. The sleep was elusive. Finally, I just got up. To the bathroom, I staggered. I stopped in front of the shower. The dim lighting caught my weary gaze in the medicine cabinet's mirror. How could I look like this and not immediately fall asleep, I wondered. Yet, I couldn't help but think about Phyllis's ghost stories or what I saw on film. Sweat sunk into my heavy pajamas. Rather than grief, another devastating emotion had spread throughout my body. Fear. My kids and I had nowhere else to go. No matter what was in this house, we wouldn't be able to run away from it like we had with Jesse's death. A shiver crawled up my spine. I ran my hands along my arms. Somehow, the room had gotten colder. A low cry startled me, the noise between a groan and a pleading voice, the sound of a murky man. The medicine cabinet creaked open just ajar. Now I had a better view of the shower behind me, and its moving curtain. From behind it, I could see a hand brushing against the cloth. The man's voice grew even louder, harsher. Frozen in fear, I stood there shivering. My eyes stayed glued to the mirror, to the reflection of my frightened face and whatever the hell was in that shower. Like readjusted audio, the man's voice drifted toward me. His slow, agonizing whisper became decipherable. Macon, he said. Reserves of fear struck me. I recognized the man's voice. Jesse was home. Jesse's voice hit a crescendo of a cry, a painful yell. Panicking, I slammed the cabinet shut, and then the voice stopped. The shower curtain went completely still. I stood there, in the silent cold. My eyes confronted the mirror. In a flourish, the shower curtain slid all the way open. The shrill metal slide screamed through the room. Megan! Jesse cried. Through the mirror, I looked on in horror. My husband stood right there in the shower. I'd only seen his corpse once before. A brief second before I collapsed into a weeping mess. But right now, Jesse was here. His gory remains more vivid and disturbing than ever. Like a disjointed mask, his face dangled off to the side, 
exposed muscles lurked beneath the mangled flesh. The deep slices on Jesse's face deeper than an excavated pit. Blood covered his skin and tattered undershirt and boxers. His eyes were blank and lifeless. Like a dead dog, his tongue dangled out of a pale mouth. Fresh, dark blood poured over his lips. Jesse's hand reached toward me. Macon, he struggled to yell. The sight sent me into an emotional oblivion. My heart pounded. Tears streamed down my face. Sobbing, I turned away. But Jesse was gone. The shower curtain was back where it was, and the dead silence had returned. Anxiety, rather than the cold, was making me shiver now. No, I said. I ran up and tore open the curtain. No one was there. I scanned the bathroom, but all I saw was my nervous reflection. I was alone. The last thing I wanted to do was scare the kids, especially with stories of their ghostly daddy following them home. I wiped away my tears. Even though I was a horrible actor, I did my best to feign strength rather than fear. I walked back into the bedroom. Waiting for me like a lonely hitchhiker, Jason was wide awake and sitting on the edge of the bed. Concerned, I rushed toward him. Jason, what are you doing? As I sat next to him, I noticed Kate was still asleep. Silent and sullen, Jason just looked at me behind robotic eyes. I wrapped my arm around him. Baby, what's wrong? Why are you still awake? I saw him too, mommy. Jason said with the stoic coolness of a therapist 30 years his senior. Stunned, I couldn't talk. My only response was to cling to his shoulders and keep him in a protective grip. Together, we laid back down, and our shared secret only made me hold onto him tighter than I ever had before. Throughout the night, I never let go. The following afternoon, Phyllis's team finished shooting. The kids and I said goodbye to everyone. We even managed to get a few autographs and selfies with Dan and some of the actors. Phyllis stayed behind in the kitchen with me, our private farewell. Well, I hope we weren't too irritating, Phyllis joked. Nah, y'all were fine, I said. Just take the ghosts back with you. Phyllis chuckled. I didn't mean to bring them here. I cracked a smile. It's fine. Always the smooth professional, Phyllis reached toward the counter. Here. She handed me an envelope and a bulky black folder. I put the check in there. Grinning, I held up the folder. And what's this? Phyllis patted my shoulder. The script. She gave me a sly wink. Enjoy it. I got everyone to put their autographs in there as well. Like a curious child, I flipped through the pages. What's it called? Back in pitch mode, Phyllis leaned in closer, hiding from horror. I landed on the title page. Big, bold font spelled it out for me. Hiding from Horror by Brad Haskell. It should be on Netflix in October, Phyllis continued. We said our goodbyes. I even got Phyllis's number in case I ever wanted to talk or maybe visit LA. Phyllis was already looking into getting an office in Atlanta, so she wanted to stay in touch. I figured she also wanted to use Bisham again at some point. That night, after putting the kids to sleep, I stayed up late in my office. I was working on a novel, my third first attempt. All I had was a lamp and a bottle of wine for company. 
I guess I figured I had the time now. Not to mention a great influence. After all, horror was my genre of choice up until Jesse passed. And having a copy of the script sitting on the desk was a nice little motivator. I got through a few pages before taking a wine break. Upon finishing a glass, curiosity got the better of me. I searched IMDb for all the information I could on the Phyllis movie. To my surprise, there was a Hiding from Horror already out, one that was released on Netflix in October 2018. Sure enough, the cast and crew were all the same, not to mention all the promo photos and stills featured my own home, Bisham Manor. Like a detective, I explored further. I found Hiding on Netflix and hit play. During the load, I checked out other Google results for the movie. My brief wine buzz died in a horrifying finish. The fear had returned. Several articles detailed a troubling shoot for hiding from horror. A tragic slaughter had ensued in February of 2018. Most of the cast and crew were victims to the unsolved murders. Police suspected ritualistic slayings but none of the articles dared mention the grisly details. Amongst the victims were many recognizable names, and seeing Phyllis Burton and Dan Crawford amongst them struck me like a blade to the heart. And then, Hiding from Horror came on. The movie swallowed up my screen and left me trembling in dread. Cold air swirled all around me like a powerful soundtrack. I couldn't turn the movie off. Not even when I realized the kids and I were the leads. Or when Bishop Manor was the setting. Or when I figured out the plot was all about Jesse's ghost following us here. Somehow, the four of us had become the stars to this fucking terrifying movie. A riveted audience, I stayed seated the entire time. The magnet scene was in there, as was my vision in the bathroom. Jesse's spirit looked just like I saw him. Just as his corpse had looked, his face was a gory smorgasbord. The love for his family still a driving force even beyond the grave. The movie got closer to the end. I only had a few minutes left. My dread hit its peak. Trying to stay warm, I folded my arms. The last scene showed my home office. Everything was accurate down to the slightest detail. I could even make out the script sitting on my desk. No, I said, through the fear. Panicking, I looked all around the room. I didn't see any cameras. Nothing that could match the cinematic quality of what I saw on screen. The horror ate me alive. Much like the movie title, I'd done my best to hide from what happened to Jesse. But now, here I was. Trapped. Trembling in my pajamas, I confronted the computer once more. There I was, in my office, in the same clothes and shivering and looking at the computer screen. Only in the movie, Jesse now walked into frame. His steps were slow and methodical. A messy pool of blood trailed behind him. He had his rotten hands outstretched for me. His mangled flesh further hung off his face like a tattered crimson flag. Somehow, his ghost now looked worse and more frightening. But Jesse still wanted me. He needed me. Sitting in my chair, I couldn't breathe. Tears formed in my eyes. I was still a prisoner to the movie. And I refused to turn around. My mind started telling me, it's only a movie, Megan. It's only a movie. 
but the pathetic mantra went extinct once I heard footsteps splashing through the room. Don't turn around, Macon. Don't turn around. Became my next internal chant. Advice I was determined to heed. Even as those footsteps got closer and closer, and even when I heard Jesse's faint cry, Macon, his tormented voice pleaded. Don't turn around, Macon, I kept telling myself, even though I already knew Jesse's voice hadn't come from the computer screen. He was right behind me. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over at Patreon and YouTube memberships. Your support makes these narrations possible, and I appreciate it a ton. If you'd like to join these lovely ghouls, you can head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash clancypasta, or click the join button below to become a member. Through Patreon, you can gain access to extra videos, on-screen thanks in the end credits of every video, personal shoutouts in a special video once a month, autograph stickers, merch store discounts, exclusive Discord roles, and much, much more. And if you'd like creepy cool shirts, make sure to head on over and check out my official merch store, creepycoolshirts.com, for some awesome tees, hoodies, stickers, and more. Alright, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great night. Cheers.